Hello, everybody. And this is Stacy from The Advisor. And today I'm so very excited because we have a very special guest. His name is Corey Poirier, and he is an author, and he has just written a book, and he's going to talk about some of the topics in the book because it's just amazing. He talks about abundance, the importance of saying no, and many other topics that you know we may not think are a big deal, but they affect our life tra tra uh, traumatically. And just by making some little tweaks in our lives here and there and changing things around, you could ha actually have the life you always dreamt of. And Corey's going to talk a little about all these things that really matter and that you really should focus on. So Corey, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. I guess about myself, uh, I, I'm from a small town. I was raised by a single mother. I uh, barely graduated high school. Uh, didn't know the difference between fiction and nonfiction when I did graduate. And, uh, you know, so I guess I was certainly not somebody that was listed as likely to succeed in any area. And um, I, I guess, ultimately, I did eventually feel like I was being called to do something bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And I got tricked one night into performing stand-up comedy. And that evolved into me speaking because uh, one of the comics invited me to go see Tony Robbins speaking. And he said, can you believe he's getting paid that much to do this? And I said, wait, how much is he getting paid? And he told me what he heard. And I was like, ooh, I, I need to know more about that because I'm going <laughs> to perform a comedy and I'm getting you know $10 <laughs> from all the to drive there to drive them there and i'm getting five bucks from the door and <laughs> performing in front of people that are drunk and heckling and all that kind of stuff yeah. so so basically that started my journey as a speaker now i kept doing comedy for nine years i performed like 700 shows but uh i also moved into speaking and that evolved into very quickly paid speaking that evolved into you know within a couple of years me leaving my corporate career which was paying me quite well to, you know, do nothing if I want it, but that's not who I am. And, uh, and so I went full time as a speaker. I often say now that I thought if I build it, they will come. And I started building it. Nobody even heard the hammer. Uh, so <laughs> a lot harder than I thought I had no mentors to learn the speaking trade. But I went down the path of speaking, I figured out some I'll call them shortcuts or hacks. They allowed me to um, start really building a speaking business. And I, within a couple of years, I was into multiple six figures solely from speaking. And I didn't think that was significant even after having the challenges I did until people started coming to me saying, how are you doing this? How are you yeah. getting paid so well and so often? And I figured out that was kind of like one of my little superpowers. It's kind of ironic because at first I couldn't figure out how to do it at all. Yeah. Um, and banging my head against the wall for so long trying to figure out how to do it. I came up with some little ideas. I'm like, oh, how come nobody's ever mentioned this? How come I never thought of this? And they changed everything. And so that was 20 some years ago. Since that time, I've been a speaker for most of those years. Uh, and then I always had side hustles. Like I had a newspaper on the side for years that evolved into a podcast mm -hmm. uh, that evolved in actually evolved first into an online radio show. That tells you how long I've been doing this, the mm -hmm. podcasting side of things. Uh, then it evolved into podcast, a podcast. And now as a podcast, I think it's about 12 years old, but it started mm -hmm. about 17 years ago as an online radio show. Um, and then the full circle, everything, I, you know, I started getting into writing, even though I hadn't read a book until age 27 uh, or 26. I wrote a book the following year after I finally read one. And then I <laughs> continued to either publish books, co-author books or write books. And that kind of brings us full circle. Uh, four years ago, we launched a thing called Blue Talks, which would be like TED Talks meets Chicken Soup for the Soul. Mm -hmm. The idea is we wanted to help other people get on platforms. Yeah, uh, we, That's been almost five years. We've had I think probably around 550 people speak on our stages. Wow. Uh, we've run events at, at, at every everywhere from Harvard to Columbia to Oxford to Cambridge to UCLA to Stanford to MIT and so on. Uh, we put out 12 uh, anthology books, some of them with big name thought leaders like more recently, Ken Honda from Mind Valley, James Redfield who wrote Celestine Prophecy, Dr. Joe Vitale from The Secret, Marie Diamond from The Secret. Uh, we have one coming up at the late Bob Proctor, who passed away a few years ago from an interview I did with him. We got permission to turn it into a foreword. And so uh, I've been really focused on helping other people get their message out. I used to say I was like the surfer on the surfboard saying, look at me, I'm doing stuff. And now I'm trying to create the waves for other surfers. So uh, we also have a podcast and a virtual event for Blue Talks. And then finally, we launched uh, not as long ago, uh, an experts bureau where we go out and try to find opportunities for people in our bureau. So like media and speaking, what have you. So 
in about, I guess that was about five minutes. That's kind of me uh, in a nutshell. And then like we brought up earlier, uh, or like you mentioned earlier, a reference, uh, I do have a new book out right now. Uh, for those that might be seeing this on the screen, it's also on the screen beside me. But I launched this book called The Enlightened Passenger. Uh, it's just about to hit actual launch. So when you're list depending when you're listening to this, it could already be out. Uh, but basically, this is a fictional parable uh, about two strangers on a plane, uh, one a reluctant passenger and doesn't want to listen. The other one uh, wants to share some wisdom and the flight changes everything for, I think, both people. So wow. that's me in a big nutshell. I love it. I love it. And what I love is that you took your passion and you made it become a reality, which is, you know, is, is so many people's dreams. So many people, you know, they, 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 you know, it's, it's so hard even to figure out what your purpose in life is. They have passions and, you know, people, people strive almost to the middle of their lives, trying to figure out what their purpose in life is. You know, what were they meant to be? What were they meant to do in this life? What gives them enjoyment? And, you know, you were one of those people that, you know, you went from stage one from just doing comedy and saying, you know, it's, you know, this is not exactly what I want to, where I want to be in life, you know, and, uh, you know, I have what it takes and why am I not there? And, you know, how did you go about really figuring out first what your true passion was? Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, I, I kind of revealed that uh, without telling you that's how I found it, but the irony is, is I found it that night on that stand-up comedy stage. Mm -hmm. So when I got tricked into performing stand-up, um, I basically uh, got tricked into it and ended up performing, uh, bombed horribly, as they say in comedy. Like I, was <laughs> the whole uh, I didn't even know. I actually, I tell the story often that I didn't even know to turn the mic on. So I started telling the jokes and the mic wasn't even on. Oh, uh, no. Uh, but that night, I... I bombed, but I caught, like I did something I thought I would never do. Right. Uh, and I had a vision. I was sitting at the side of the stage. This is the vision I had as an old man looking at the stage at younger people doing comedy saying, I was going to do that one night. I wish I would have. And that regret was worse than the fear. So I got up, I bombed horribly, but I went to work the next day and people were like, did you meet someone last night? Cause you have a different aura about you. And honestly, that's the minute I figure now, I think now that I discovered a passion, not yes. necessarily my purpose, but a passion, but that became the gateway because I kept doing the comedy and then I started doing the speaking and it took a long time, but eventually the purpose, the why I'm doing it eventually revealed itself. That's amazing. You know, I, I think that's great. You really like listen to your inner inter intuition inside you, you know, and you kind of just followed, you know, what your intuition was telling you, you through different things that happened to you in life, you kind of learn from them, you kind of felt certain ways and things about you had changed and you just went with it. You just went with how you were feeling and you took a chance, which is great because so many people fear change, but yet you weren't as scared to, to, you know, you know, face your fears. And, you know, it, it shows just even just going up and doing comedy. That will be my biggest fear. I love comedy, but the biggest fear I ever ha I would ever have is going up there telling a joke and, and everyone just looks at you, you know, and I don't think I could ever do that just because of that, you know, but, you know, you you accomplish all that, you overcame your fears and you're here today and, you know, you're feeling that abundance, you're feeling fulfilled in your life. And and how does that feel? And, and you know, and was it a long journey or, you know, did, did things just fall into place and things started to just snowball? You know what, uh, that, so if I look at it now in reverse, yeah, no snowball. Like there was no, <laughs> there, it was like slow and slow and slow. But what I did notice, and this, I talk to this often, I, one of the, one of my talks is about how to become the instant expert. And the misnomer there is people might think it's like the, almost like a Facebook ad that says how to make a million dollars. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's quick or whatever. It's not meant to be that. What it's meant is, uh, and it's not meant to that you become an expert in what you do. It's right. that we can help position you as the expert to your potential clients. Yes. But it can't be manipulated. It's got to be true in my opinion. So what I mean by that is that if you have an as seen on banner, like you do behind you right now, yeah. they've showed that if the right names are on there and, and you have the right names on there, if the right names are on there, it can increase your credibility by 70%. Which, if you doubt that, think about people like Anthony Robbins or Tony Robbins and Jack Canfield. These people have spent how much money learning the business? And yeah. Jack Canfield's a marketing genius, sold 600 million books, 
And all of them, all these thought leaders have the as seen on banner near the top of their page. That's not a mistake. Yeah. And so what you're getting at is you become the instant expert whenever somebody sees a video of you speaking at MIT, when somebody sees as seen on Dr. Oz, when somebody uh, sees you co-authored a book with so-and-so, or you're a Burns and Noble bestselling author. So we try for Burns and Noble because everybody seems to be able to say Amazon now, but <laughs> Burns and Noble stands out. Yeah. And so what I'm getting at with that is that we teach people now how to become the instant expert in four months. They're getting what the credibility that it took me 15 years to get. Right. And it, but it's all legitimate Stacy in the sense that we're getting those stages. We're doing the things they're yeah. doing all the things. It's just, we're giving them the shortcut. Whereas me, I had to fight battle in the trenches, you know, uh, fists in hand, gun in hand, trying to get the first little juice of media and all the first little things. So for me, it was a long journey, Yeah. but where the snowball happened is once certain things were on my quote unquote um, bio or achievement list, yeah. then snowball. So for instance, um, the TEDx side, like, so when I landed my first TEDx talk, things started happening quicker. Like, right. you know, I would get a booking and they would announce me as a TEDx speaker and people would look over when they said those words. I knew that that was doing something. Then right. whenever I did the second TEDx, I recognized that I only need two to say multiple time TEDx speaker and multiple could be a hundred or two. Mm -hmm. Meaning like you get the same credibility as if you did 500. When yeah. you do two. So I knew I had to do a second one. And then when I did the second one, it could say multiple time TEDx speaker. I stood out again. Whenever I got on the Burns and Noble list, like I said, it stood out more than Amazon because yeah. most can say Amazon. And then I realized, oh, it's not that hard to get on the Apple books and Kobo. So now all of a sudden I could say all them. Then I was in a co-author book with uh, for Wall Street Journal USA Today list. Mm -hmm. And then that's a huge credibility boost. So now on my bio, it's it can be very long because some people want a long form bio. But honestly, it can be as short as Corey is a five-time TEDx speaker, uh, mm -hmm. Wall Street Journal USA Today bestselling author, the founder of Blue Talks, and a success magazine uh, emerging entrepreneur of 2022. Right. Or 20, can't remember which year it is. Uh, anyway, <laughs> but those, those four things, I could just have those and leave it at that. Now, why I bring that up is because those are the four that have allowed me to snowball the rest. Right. But it took 20 years to get to those four, if that makes sense. Like, oh, I, yeah. To get to in success magazine for as long as i can remember i was a huge reader of success magazine i was all now try to get in is is relative sometimes we think we're working hard when all we're really doing is trying to manifest it and yeah. saying i want to be in there or putting it on a vision board but so it's relative i might have sent two articles into my life I, that's not really working that hard but i was <laughs> hoping you know the more people i connected with the more relationships i build somebody would say oh I want to write an article about you for success. Like I thought that would happen and it didn't. So yeah. interestingly enough, um, don't mind me jumping off screen for one sec, but I want to show you <laughs> just really quick. Uh, but I'll show you what ended up happening. It took again, 20 years. Yeah. I feel like something like that. Um, if I can find it quickly, of course, when you're trying to find it, it takes a second. Oh, there it is. Um, but then I finally got in. I know it's hard with, um, I don't, what's that here? Hard, success uh, emerging yeah so and i mean it's terrible one sec let me try this where is this here there we go oh, <laughs> no, it's terrible anyway i'm on that page there i am see, there you are i see you i see you okay so that's in success magazine and so um the reason i bring that up is because that was whatever 20 years in the making but i wanted it two years in but it wasn't the right time yeah and so it took a long time and then they gave me and this was like one of the biggest things in the world to me a, a little plaque uh -huh. That's a, you know, from success magazine. Well, to be honest with you, that, that combination to me, even though the, the, the achievements don't mean much to me, that's more fulfilling than if I would have just had an article about me in success magazine. Yeah. Yeah. So I, again, that was a, a long tangent because I'm passionate about the fact that, um, it wasn't a snowball. If anything, it was like, uh, it was a piece of snow that yeah, I kept yeah. trying to push together and eventually as I did more and more things, eventually it became a snowball right? and eventually it got easier. And now it's become much easier. Having said that, still a lot of work. Like uh, we're doing it. We did an interview last uh, month or a month and a half ago with Brian Austin Green. Mm -hmm. So Brian, for those that wouldn't know, maybe he was David in 90210. He was in anger management with Charlie Sheen. Uh, it's really hard to get interviews with actors. Like it's just a different world because there's usually yeah. publicists involved and and so that interview through a mutual friend who is good friends with him and works with him, uh, it still took us like four, four months to get the interview done. Right. And it was yes until the day before. Mm -hmm. So he messaged me the day before and he said, oh my God, I, I feel uh, we should 
I picked this conversation back up. I said, you're not going to believe this, but we're running an event at UCLA tomorrow. You want in? That's how it happened. But wow. it was four months, nobody seen behind the scenes of trying to make that interview happen. And now we're doing an interview for the book. I'm bringing them on for an event, him and Randy Spelling. So we're doing like a 90210 type thing. Oh, nice. Um, we're going to do a live event and the cost to get in will be a cost of my book, basically. Um, but my point is the second time was easier because now we have a relationship. Right. So again, I know I went on a big tangent, but yeah, no. it hasn't been an instant snowball, but over time it gets slightly easier. I agree with you. You know, it, it took me about 25 years to build my name and to be in the magazines and to do the things that I wanted to do. But during the, you know, during the time, it was like little snowflakes, like you said, you know, but I guess because you, you enjoy what you do, you don't even realize the the time that goes by. You just keep working at it and you keep trying harder and harder until you actually get to where you want to go because you have that that compassion, that love, that fire underneath your ass, basically, you know, to, to get where you really want to go, you know, and uh, I think it's so important. And I love how you had mentioned over before the show that it's okay to say no, you know, like, you know, a lot of times when you were, when you were, I'm sure, you know, once you start to get your name recognized, a lot of people come out of the woodwork and everybody's asking for something or everyone's promising something and, and, you know, or, you know, there's people out there that need help, but it's not the right time. And I think the biggest thing for people is to say no. It's very hard for people to say no, even though, you know, it's not going to benefit them. Can you go into a little bit more about about the importance of being able to say no. Uh, yeah, I absolutely can. And to your point, uh, it, it, you do see a shift happen. Now, I want to add to um, even the things that I so casually talk about now. This mm -hmm. is something that people might not know because sometimes people say, what, what's something people don't know about you? But I grew up in a tiny little town. And um, so a lot of people wouldn't realize that, A, I was taught to say yes to everything and then try to figure out how to do it. Uh, <laughs> be nice and you're supposed to be nice. Yes. Um, at the same time, I was taught to never talk about an achievement. My grandfather was a carpenter with a grade three education. He built a fiberglass space shuttle to scale mm -hmm. and tell a soul. And that it was wow. a big, a big feat. And he'd never yeah. tell anybody until we brought it up. And then by the time he could get him talking about it, he'd never stop because he was so, he was so, had so much pride in it, but he could never say to somebody, I built that. We, yeah. He would drive by it. I'd be with him in the car. He'd never say a word about it. Wouldn't wow. even look. Like it was just, and so I witnessed that. So it was really hard. I bring this up because it might seem casual for me to say, you know, now when I was featured in Success Magazine or this or that, that still is a bit hard, but that was really hard for me to even say that out loud about myself for years. And I still don't insert it into conversation. People yeah. I grew up with, I, I've jokingly said that they don't, you know, they don't even know what I do for a living. People I <laughs> live near, people I, I'm friends with. Um, because I don't think you need to speak it. I think, right. you know, you just go out and, and make as much magic as you can happen and let the chips fall where they may. Yeah. Getting back to the no thing though, it relates to this small town because I was taught just say yes to everything. Um, what I've learned, Stacey, I've, I've had the opportunity to interview 7,000 plus influencers. So I feel like this is a real study. You know, this isn't just like Corey pulling it out of his hat. Yeah. Um, this is like, you know, if you think about like Nielsen studies, they're done with like hundreds of people. This yeah. is like thousands. Uh, actually, Think and Grow Rich, I think, was written based on 500 people. You know, mm -hmm. the book sold 100 million copies and impacted millions of lives. Yeah. Uh, so I think 7,500 roughly is a good study. And what I discovered is that the average person says, uh, well, I'll say it this way. The in average influencer that I've studied says no 20 to 50 times more than the average person. Wow. Now, the key things are, though, what do they say no to and how do they know what a no is? Right. Uh, how do they say no without burning a bridge mm -hmm. and, and so on. And, and then we could even go one step further because depending on who's listening, if you're an entrepreneur a no is going to be different because you can say no a lot easier than if you're working for somebody else. Yes. So I want to be clear. I'm not saying Corey says, say no to your boss. <laughs> and <you're set> fired. <laughs> not only that, it's easier to say no about moving the furniture to a, a, a good friend than mm -hmm. it is to a spouse who you're moving with. Right. You know, so <laughs> there's, there's, there's levels of no. But I want the takeaway to be is that we need to figure out what a yes and a no is to us and, and start saying it more openly. Yeah. And like I said, if you want to join people that are impacting a lot of lives, you have to do to some degree what they're doing. Right. And I was saying yes way too often. And going back to the other point, yeah, the requests come in a lot more uh, as you push that snowball up the hill. So for example, right now I'm sitting on two people asking me to endorse their book, uh, for nice, these are ones I've basically said yes to. Yeah. Um, uh, four people, I haven't said yes to these ones. Four people asked me to write the forward for their book. You know, and, and 
it's funny because uh, it used to be people would say, hey, can you give me uh, Lisa Nichols phone number so mm -hmm. I can uh, reach out to her and see if she'll endorse my book? Yeah. And, and that's for no, by the way, but um, that uh, that people would ask that because they, they didn't care about me endorsing the book or forward. And now I'm getting those requests. And so it's the same thing. There's two sides to that on one hand, if you endorse the book, you get more exposure. Yeah. If you write the forward, you get more exposure. And if, if it happens, I mean, there's not a lot of books that go viral these days, but if the book went viral and you wrote the forward, you're along for that ride. Yeah. So saying no can be hard. If I was just starting my journey, I, I would never say no to writing a forward. Right. But now writing a forward takes a lot of time. It does. it does. And so you have to know what to say no to. And I've had um, people um, that, you know, fairly big names that I built strong relationships with that have said, no, Corey, I can't do it. I don't have the time. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I have to respect that because I've learned that it's important to say no, even when it's hard to say no. Yeah. Uh, but then also at the same time, if you keep building those relationships, sometimes you might be surprised. For instance, uh, Richard Paul Evans, who wrote The Christmas Box, wrote the foreword for the new book. Uh, Richard told me he hadn't written a foreword for somebody in 13 years <laughs> because of how much work it takes to write a foreword. Yeah. And, and he said, it's like I'm writing a whole book because that's yeah. how much, I shouldn't say that's how much he care he puts into writing the foreword. Right, exactly. And I think he did write one other one more recently as well. But my point being is that um, I, that means he probably had to say no numerous times, even though he really wanted to say yes. So right. that's just a random example, but there's media I have to say no to. There's uh, opportunities where maybe there's an investment involved, but years ago it would have been, I'll pay anything to get this opportunity. And now I have to say no. There's opportunities, like I say, to, to be a part of books that I have to say no to. And so, yeah, it's gotten harder and harder and it's still hard for me to say no. I struggle with that. Yeah. But I have to say no uh, if I want to keep saying and if I want to impact more lives, because here's the one thing I learned, Stacey, is every yes you say to somebody is a no to something or somebody else. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if I say yes to writing that forward, I might be saying no to my kids this weekend. Right. And so you have to do look at it that way. Uh, since we've gone this far, are you okay with me telling people how I decide what a no is and how to say no? Oh, 100%. Go ahead. So it's fairly straightforward. Um I'll say it's fairly straightforward it, once you get, um, you know, I'll say get used to the idea of figuring out what your purpose and mission is. Um, so basically for me, uh, my purpose and uh, mission is to be the guy who motivates, donates, inspires, educates, and entertains. And so for me, what that means is that's my five point system. It's what my personal mission statement is. And so when people say, can you do this for me? Mm -hmm. I put it against those five points. Is it going to help me motivate? Is it going to help me donate? Is it going to help me inspire? If it's zero of those and I didn't want to do it in the first place, it's an easy no without regret. If yeah. it's four or five of those, it's mostly going to be an easy yes without regret, unless I have too many of those four and five out of fives. But yes. for the most part, that's an easy system. You figure out what your mission is. Like I want to be the best parent. And then somebody asks you to write in a book that talks about how children are evil. Yeah. Well, that doesn't work with your mission statement. So that's right. an easy. And so, and I've had opportunities to be on a show, like co-host or be a part of a show on national TV, but it had nothing to do with what I do and it won't move the needle at all. Yes. It's an easy no. And so the mission statement is how I decide what to say no to. The last part is, how do you say no without burning a bridge? I learned this during an interview with Shailene Johnson. Mm -hmm. who, for those that don't know, she was the creator of Turbo Jam. She's an Instagram influencer. And Shailene, uh, I asked her, how do you juggle everything? And she said, at the time, she had like 600 classes, I think, throughout America teaching Turbo Jam. And the ones that were close to where she lived, the instructors would ask her if she could fill in whenever they couldn't make it for whatever reason. And at first, she was saying yes. And then she realized it was overwhelming her. So what she did was she said, which is true, you know, we're a very family oriented business and I'm very family first. So she said, I need to ask my husband, Brett, before I take this on, if we can take this on and, right. and make sure he hasn't booked something else that I'd be saying, if I say yes to you, I don't want to go home and then disappoint my kids. Yeah. And so she said, if it's okay with you, give me a couple of days with this. And if I can't do it, I'll try to find somebody else who can. And what she said happened is 99% of the time, by the time she went back, they're like, I already got that figured out. That's old news. <laughs> so it already got figured out for her. Or the other side is, um, you know, she did find somebody that could help them. But here's the point. 
how can you get mad at somebody who's saying, I just need to make sure I won't be disappointing my kids? Right, exactly. So whatever that is for you, if you don't have a family, you figure out what that replacement is, but figure out what you are saying no to that you don't want to say no to whenever you say yes to somebody else and figure out a way to explain to them, this is why I have to at least take some time. Yeah. So versus like, it, it, it'd be easier to pull off the bandaid and just say, I'm sorry, no. But right. no matter how you say no to that person that's asking, it comes across as, I can't believe they let me down or what have you. Right. So to me, ask for time. And the time will allow them to figure out if they can find a solution. The time will allow you to figure out the best way to handle it. The time will show them I'm taking this seriously, not just blowing you off. Right. I found uh, so far, knock on some wood, that uh, was six, seven years ago, I learned that and and, I, and I've and i used it and, and it's always true. I mm -hmm. don't know when my wife is gonna schedule. We have a six and a three year old and I don't know when she's gonna schedule stuff. So truly it could interfere. And so right. that's, so hopefully that's a summary of why you should say no, yes. what's a no and a yes and how to say no. And I think that's important because I think sometimes people, either they say it the wrong way when, or they don't give a, a an explanation, you know, where someone else could relate to or understand to or empathize with. And, you know, it, that's how you don't, like you said, you don't burn bridges, you know, and uh, I think it's important because I think that's a, a topic that so many people struggle with, you know, and I think you've answered it really well because, you know, so many people either they were grown up and raised to say yes and be courteous. And that's a problem too, because you grew up to be a people pleaser and you're pleasing everybody else but yourself, you know, and are you really benefiting? you know, you're so worried about everybody else that the last person on the list is yourself. And how can you care for others if you can't care for yourself first, you know? So true. hundred percent. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> but, you know, as you go along, like as you were writing the book, what are other things, you know, that, that you, you know, really emphasized on that you feel are really important to discuss today? Cause I know I'm sure, do you ever get revelations when you're writing? Cause sometimes when I would write a book, like, things would just come to me like all of a sudden like thoughts and feelings and, uh, and emotions would start coming into my head and I would start writing them down and I didn't even plan to to have them in the book but it ended up being in the book because it just like it just flowed while I was writing did you have any of those moments when you were writing your book uh I mean so for me I'm, I'm a unique I'm gonna say type of writer in the sense that for me the challenge and I don't want to jinx myself so I even feel bad saying it sometimes but I'm a writer that it feels like it's sort of channeled through me. So I haven't yet, I'm going to knock it some wood. And I started writing music, for instance, when I was 12. Mm -hmm. And I haven't yet had writer's block. Okay, so good. I haven't yet had a time. Like, so if I sit down to write, as long as I have, so with the book, I had an idea. So I had a start and a finish. I knew what the beginning and end would be. Uh, I have written books where I didn't know any of that. I just said, I want it to be about this and sat down. In any of those times, I've been served what I was looking for. Yes. And so for me, I don't really get pulled away much because like when I'm actually writing the book, I'm immersed in the characters. Like in this case, it was characters. What my previous book was called the book of why and how that was a nonfiction. But even in that case, I get immersed in building this thing from scratch, let's say. And so no, I don't really get pulled in other directions. Right. Uh, so when I'm writing music, like if I'm writing music, some of my best songs were written in eight minutes, five minute mm -hmm. songs. So like no thinking about what rhymes with orange. Yeah. I just, Sat down and, <laughs> and by the way, nothing rhymes with orange. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, from that end, um, yeah, it all just uh, seemed to flow. But yeah, I didn't have other necessarily ideas as I was doing it. For me more, it was about writing it. And then I would start thinking about how can I market it with how I'm writing it. So like, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of something that uh, just came to me um, recently but it was about um, how can we promote the book and get the attention of some thought leaders that normally wouldn't maybe pay attention. Yeah. And so one of the things we did was we printed off airplane tickets and they say from wherever you, like wherever that person lives. So if it was Los Angeles, from Los Angeles to enlightenment mm -hmm. and it has your name and your seat and all that. And it Matt, it's on brand with the colors of the book. So we have a mail that we're doing probably tomorrow with 75 of these thought leaders. But we went uh, one step further. We actually thought about, okay, well, who was impacted by The Alchemist? Like what celebrities have said, The Alchemist changed my life because it's a book similar to The Alchemist. Yeah. 
And so we're trying to think, well, if, if you like the alchemist, we need to get you to open the book to see uh, the, the tickets are just for you to go, what's this ticket now? What's that? Where am I flying? And then they're like, oh, that's cheesy or clever or whatever, but it gets, it gets a pattern interrupt. So they go, oh, what's this book about then? We don't know if it'll work, but my right. point is the kind of things that'll come to my mind while I'm working on a book, Yeah. More so I'll write notes about what I want to do in the marketing, uh, more so than other ideas outside of the book, if that makes sense. Oh, it makes total sense. Now, ha have there been certain things that you've done that you've helped that's helped your growth and helped your career so you could uh, actually evolve and elevate to levels where you could really help the large group of people that you're helping right now? Um, yeah, I mean, so throughout, I, so I'll say one of the things that's helped me a lot is because I've done all these interviews and I've studied the thought leaders uh, approach to things, habits, what have you. Those are the things that I applied. So if I learned something from somebody, I, I would say, I'm going to execute this and see how it works for me. Right. And that's allowed me to impact other people because I'm studying at the feet of these giants and trying to learn what they did and test it in real time. So then I can teach it to other people and share it with other people. Right. So for instance, um, Jack Canfield talks about the hour of power. Yeah. And so I did that for years. I mean, I got to get back to it actually. But basically the premise was the first hour of every day before he touches his phone or anything else, Jack dedicates 20 minutes to reading, 20 minutes to exercising and 20 minutes to meditating. I like so that. Distractions. And so I always say like he's feeding his mind, body and spirit before most people wake up. Yeah. And so when I learned that and then I, I started applying it in my life. Another one, I don't think I have it in front of me here. I know it's somewhere here on the table, the office desk, uh, but I have this chip I did uh, two actually poker chip and it says E plus R equals O. Mm -hmm. And that's something I learned years ago, which is basically it stands for event plus response equals outcome. Mm -hmm. And the real world, what that means is you get cut off in traffic. How do you respond? Because however you respond is going to dictate your outcome. So right. people don't realize, yeah, you can't change the event. You can complain the price of gas went up. But what you can do is you can choose how you respond to the price of gas going up. And that will give you an outcome. Yes. Uh, you get to control that outcome by how you respond. So I carry that chip around. Whenever I have stuff bad happen, then that chip's in my pocket to remind me, you know what? I can't change the event. It's time right. to figure my best response here. Uh, so those are the kind of things I've learned from thought leader interviews that I practice every day. That's amazing. Are there any specific uh, leaders that really have made an impact on your life that you really, you know, when you met them, they really shined and really brought some light into your world? There's, I mean, honestly, there's, there's many, uh, but come like, you know, looking at come to mind, uh, I would say, so James Redfield who wrote the Celestine prophecy. Uh, we worked on a project together for a, quite a while and I learned a lot of stuff from him directly. Like um, mm -hmm. one of the things he talks about in the Celestine is why we should acknowledge synchronicities and that we'll get more of them that way. Yeah. Uh, and I think his approach was more like verbally say, thank you for the synchronicity. Uh, but I was like, I want to try to, is there a way I can do this? That'll physically make me do it. So it, it sticks to me to remind me to do it. Yeah. And so I started using what I talked about in the new book, a synchronicity journal. Mm -hmm. So whenever I have a synchronicity that I'm like, that's amazing. I write it down in the book. And what I've noticed is I have them multiple times a week. Whereas before it used to be once every five years, we call right. them coincidences or whatever. Now, is it that I have more of them because I I'm aware of them or is it because I acknowledge them? The universe says you want more of these. I don't know the answer and I don't care. All mm -hmm. I know is like this week, I've written down five of them that are like to me earth shattering and they're happening weekly. So that's something I learned from, from James. Um, if I think further, Les Brown. So I had the opportunity uh, to interview Les numerous times, but one of those times uh, was in his living room. And we had a short interview because he had had an overnight flight. And I, I actually said, let's just make it a 25 minute interview. I knew he was probably really tired after flying back from New York. Yeah. And we did the interview. At the end of the interview, he said something to me and it's on video. And I say this, like when I share these things, like I say, it's not easy for me to share this. So I don't want people to think it's a me ink thing. Yeah. But he asked me, he said, are you a speaker too? And I said, yeah. And he said, I can tell. He said, I can always tell when I'm in the presence of greatness. Mm -hmm. And then we have that on video. And I asked, can I use that? Because it's a powerful testimonial. Yeah. But because he's taking off the mic. So, you know, it's not like a setup testimonial. Yeah. But it set after the camera turned on. And at first I was disappointed. I turned the camera off. And on the other part, I said, maybe it was just meant to be that way and not shared many times. Yeah. But he said, uh, this is your year, my friend. And, and, I, and I said, why do you say that? He goes, because you reek of love. And it's hard for me to say that about myself, but what I'm saying is that 
impacted me like you wouldn't believe somebody that I, I studied and watched as a giant saying that to me, you know, it, it, you know, it was meant probably just for me, but my point is that rocked my world. And yeah. so that is impact. Uh, I mentioned Richard Paul Evans. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's 46 time New York times bestselling author. He's been there, done that as far as the book world. And I did an interview with him and I felt like we had a, a synergy right away. Yes. And so we kind of became friends and he mentioned that he was doing his writer retreat uh, at his ranch. And I decided to sign my wife and I up and we went last June. I was there on my birthday. I celebrated my birthday with, with them. Um, this year we're going back again next month. Uh, him and I are going to actually do uh, a Facebook live or maybe a zoom, but a live with Mark Victor Hansen yes. and Crystal Hansen uh, while we're at his ranch, but do it oh, live nice. the world type thing. And there'll be a, a class of probably 35, 40 authors wanting are watching that. So, uh, but Richard, uh, a, um, just his giving nature yeah. has spoke to me, but the other side is his writing style. Like it's very much like the writing style I, I want to have when I grow up. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, it's different than like this book here I wrote would be similar to Og Mandino for those that might have heard of him. It's more of an old school writing style. Yes. Um, Richard has a way in his books. I don't want to give anything away, but the Christmas box book, uh, it, he full circles it back to the end. So if you've ever watched movies like Pulp Fiction, where mm -hmm. he starts at the beginning and works his way to the end, I really appreciate that style. Yeah. And Richard, at least in a couple of his books, I know has that style. And, and, you know, so I truly appreciate that. Uh, but then I guess bigger than that, as a person, you know, all of the success that he's had, and he's still um, the most humble person, you know, like that. I guess I, I learn from people like that, yeah. you know, whenever they're that humble that, you know what I mean? I, that sets an example for, I think what we all should practice. Oh, yeah. So there's a couple of like what I've learned as far as tangible stuff. Yes. And then also what I've actually learned by watching people and observing them. Yes. And, you know, I see how, and I think this is a lesson we can all learn. I see how when somebody like Richard talks to you, you're the only person in that room. Yeah. It's not like, we see a lot of people like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, they're not listening to you. They're ready to get on to the next thing. No, mm -hmm. he's there with you. And I watch that from afar and say, again, that's what I want to be when I grow up. Yeah. So I want to make sure people feel like I'm truly there with them. Yes. There's yeah. a lot of different things I've taken from different leaders. And like, I, that's one of those things, 7,000 interviews. And you can probably tell by my memory, I can go through almost all those interviews. So it's hard for me to sum up a few. That's why I listed probably four there. No, that's, that's amazing. I love it. I love it. And and it's really good to when you meet lead, thought leaders, or if you read about them, or if you study them, you do really, you learn a lot of great things from it. You know, you could pull certain qualities or characteristics that they do that you feel are so beneficial and incorporate them into your own personal way of doing things that can enhance your own you know, career or your personal life even. And, you know, just the way you do things or you think of things or, you know, it could have a hum humongous impact. Now, if you wanted to take today's conversation and you wanted to like emphasize on a few things, what are some of the things you really would like the readers to, uh, you know, really understand or learn from? Yeah. So, I mean, if I, if I reference back to the book and tie it to our conversation today, some of the things that I mentioned from the book often I mentioned them because I believe they, they changed my life and I believe they can change lives. Yeah. And I learned from other people. So this isn't me saying my wisdom is something right. I've learned, maybe curated. Uh, one of them is what we talked about earlier, start saying no more, but the caveat is you need to build your muscle up. If you have a hard time saying no in general, you can't jump in uh, and, you know, say no to your best friend mm -hmm. jump, you know, first minute after you've said yes forever. <laughs> um, so you have to say no, like mini no's what are some small no's like yes. somebody asks you do you like here is a weird example but somebody could send you an email could, you could just be on an email list and they could say hey do you want in and you just say no i don't i'm good yeah like that could be a small no but start building the no muscle so right. the takeaway is start saying no but the other start is start small the other thing is write a personal mission statement even if it's not fully done yet meaning just write stuff down and say i want to be an amazing this Yes. And then you can make it better later, but and put, I haven't folded it and it's put in my wallet, fold it and put it in your wallet, carry it around with you. And every now and then revisit, what is my mission? And that'll allow you what to know what to say no to, but also it'll help you feel like you're more aligned in life. Yes. Uh, one of the other things that really fascinated me when I learned about it, so I'll share this from the book that we didn't talk about today um, is the mayfly. So there's a chapter in the book called the mayfly. Yes. And 
actually a fly. Uh, but a lot of people don't know its story. And the story is it only lives 24 hours. Okay. However, that's the male. The oh, okay. female, three to five minutes. Oh, really? Her whole life is just born, procreate, die. And so, but the males is 24 hours. So I use the 24 hour side to say, if you were the mayfly and you had 24 hours today to live, what would you do in those 24 hours? Wow. So in the book, one character asks the other character, what would you do? And he starts going, I'd learn to play guitar. I'd do this. I'd call my old girlfriend. And he said, in your 24 hours? You know, <laughs> How would you do all that? But secondly, so he got him to be more realistic about what he would do. And then when he listened, he goes, well, here's my question for you. Why aren't you doing that now? Right. So what that is, is map out your perfect day. Yeah. What's your perfect day? And honestly, that can be different every day. Yeah. But what's your perfect day look like today? Right. Based on your, your vibe or what have you. So those are some takeaways from the book that we cover. Of course, the book is fic fictional. So it's like, it's loosely based on my life, but it's a parable yes. where these things are revealed in story and narrative. Yeah. So it's almost like uh, we're, I hate saying this word, but we're tricking you into learning. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. The alchemist, that's what I feel happened. I get tricked into learning. Yeah. And I'm for Paulo Colio for tricking me into learning. <laughs> and so that's kind of the idea is that some of these things I'm sharing, I'm sharing them now practically because I've applied them to my life. Right. But I'm saying in the book, you'll learn them through a story and hopefully an enjoyable story. But those are three things that popped into my head immediately when you said, you know, what's, what's some takeaways from today. Right. That's wonderful. I, I think those are great takeaways. I, can you tell us some of the um, services that you provide also and where we can find you? Yeah. Um, so, so services basically, I, I kind of mentioned off the top that we had this blue talks brand Mm -hmm. And this, the very easiest, quickest way to summarize that, that side of my life, because that's where I spend a lot of my time, is if you're a person who does want to get your voice out into the world, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's through a stage, whether that's through a show, a podcast, whatever that looks like, uh, yeah. through books, if you're a person that wants to get your voice out in the world, but doesn't know how to start, mm -hmm. and wants, and I'll call it the shortcut, like you want to do, like I said earlier, in four months, what it took me 15 years, with somebody yeah. help. Uh, that's what our Blue Tox brand is designed to do. So on the service side, what we really do is we provide the platforms and the knowledge to get your message out to more people, essentially. Yeah. And then if you don't even want to do the work to reach out to those people, we even do the work to reach out to get you on the platforms like an ABC, NBC news show at Fox, that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, we help on that side too. So if you're looking for somebody either A, uh, get you the type of assets I'll use that term, but like video in a book, all that stuff, uh, your bio updated to say that you've spoken on it here and you've co-authored a book with so-and-so. Uh, and then on top of that, you want somebody to pitch you. That's what our Blue Talks does. So I would say the best way to connect with us through that is either, uh, I think Speak on Blue will work and it's it's blue without the E. So speak on blu.com. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to even bypass that, if you send me a message, then I'll, you know, either myself or I'll connect you with the team to get on a call and tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, the best way to connect with me is Corey, C-O-R-E-Y, at blue, B-L-U, talks.com. So Corey at bluetalks.com. And then finally, Stacey, because, you know, we spent a lot of the time talking either about the book or what's in the book. Um, so the book people can get at, at thisisthebook.com. Mm -hmm. Not that there are too many domains of people, but this is the book.com. The cool thing is if you go there uh, and you buy it through there, now it'll send you to a retailer, you get the order number, you input it. So right. you're still buying off your preferred retailer. You're still paying the same price. But by putting it in there, we can give you bonuses automatically. And the bonuses for this are uh, a talk I did at uh, Stanford that's never been aired or about studying Apple and, and uh, Carly and, and et cetera, how they charge more and how you can do the same. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's another video about that. It it basically is a, a condensed version of the training we offer to help people land their TEDx talk. Yeah. So imagine if you could land your TEDx talk for the cost of a book. That's right. really what it's about. So you get five bonuses like that if you go that route. And the book is, I think, $16.95 US. So that's another way. Jump on, get the book. It's in pre-order phase, depending on when you're listening, or it might be ready. Uh, you'll get the bonuses instantly. Also, I'm scared to mention this because it might be passed by the time somebody's listening, but we do a live boot camp virtually every eight, nine months. And we have mm -hmm. one coming up here soon. And uh, you also, depending on when you get in, you'll get a free ticket to attend that boot camp as well. Oh, that's so awesome. lots of goodies. 
just by buying a copy of a book, which helps me with the sales on the book. It hopefully helps me impact your life because you have the book or you gift it to another reader, you know, and you get all those bonuses on top. Oh, that's awesome. That's amazing. We'll put that in the description so everybody has that information. Awesome. Yay. This has been amazing, Corey. I thank you so much for coming on the show. You've been totally amazing. Your information has just been very valuable to the listeners. It's been valuable to myself, and it's been an honor to have you on the show. So thank you so much for coming today. I hope you'll come on, you know, in the future, and we can, you know, dive into some other topics and really, you know, go deep into certain areas to help others and to help others grow like you and, and many others around this world. Because there's so many people out there that have ambitions and have dreams and either they don't think they're worthy enough or they're afraid or they just don't know how and and having somebody like you to guide them along the way and, and give them the opportunities is invaluable so thank you so much oh, thank you so much it's been my honor uh you're, you're very welcome have you have a great day you too thanks so much